Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland. Thank you. Members, we are now in public session. Uh, can I ask that all mobile phones uh, be placed in airplane mode or on silent or turned off? And it would not sufficient to put mobile phones on silent mode as they continue to interfere with assembly recording. The session is being recorded in video and audio and can be accessed live via online streaming either on the Assembly website or Democracy Live. So good afternoon members and welcome back to the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, I, ag agenda item number one is apologies. I have received apologies from Mr David Hilditch and there's apologies from the clerk. The committee, any other apologies? Okay, thank you. Uh, item agenda two, the minutes of the 8th of July 2020, pages 6 to 10 in your pack. Um, are members content? Can I sign these minutes? Great. Agrees? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Okay, okay, members, I'm going to slightly amend the agenda here. Uh, if there are any members who have a declaration of interest, um, could I add, I'm removing that to item three of the agenda, if they could declare them now, because um, we are going to be having a discussion on matters arising around a confidential pack, and therefore I think it's probably better that th those um, declarations are made before rather than after uh, the conversation and that discussion has taken place. So, has any member any declaration of interest they wish to declare today? None? Okay, thank you. Okay, um, members, uh, please refer to the correspondence from a whistleblower which was received on the 27th of August 2020 in your confidential pack. Uh, this is the uh, unredacted version of the submission that the committee had requested in the letter on the 28th of July. 2020 to the whistleblower. This would then be forwarded to the Controller and Auditor General for a response. Members, you will be aware this is a very sensitive matter, and uh, can I ask if any member wishes to have time to read through the submission or are members content to, to forward the unredacted submission to the Controller and Auditor General for uh, his response? Are members content that we do so? Content. Content. Yeah. Everyone, thank you. Great, thanks very much. Okay, item agenda five is correspondence, which is at pages 14 to 34 of your main pack. Members, please refer to the correspondence, pages 14 to 16 of your pack, dated the 3rd of July 2020, from the Committee uh, for Finance in regards to the land registry fees order. Uh, also includes a letter of explanation from the Department of Finance, Dallow, dated the 26th of June. Are members content to note? Agreed. Agreed? Agreed. Thank you. <coughs> members, please refer to the correspondence to page 17 of your pack, dated the 10th of August 2020, uh, from the Department of Finance in regards to the Department for Infrastructure's excess votes 2016 to 17. Are you content to vote? Sorry, content to, to note? <laughs> You can vote as well, I suppose, but <laughs> we'll not vote here. We agreed. Agreed. Members, please refer to correspondence at pages 18 and 19 of your pack, dated the 12th of August 2020, from the Audit Committee Senior Assistant Clerk to the Public <coughs> Accounts Committee Clerk in regards to the Northern Ireland Audit Office budget estimates for 2021. There is also a reference in correspondence pages 20 to 34 from the Department of Finance to the Audit Committee dated the 7th of August 2020, outlining the budget number three bill and the main estimates uh, for the Northern Ireland Audit Office, the NIAC and the NIPSO. Members, these figure, figures are in draft estimate uh, form and reflect those contained in the Northern Ireland Audit Office draft budget 2020-21 which the committee had noted on the 21st of February 2020 and was subsequently agreed by the Audit Committee. You will note that the Audit Committee had asked for a response by the 2nd of September. Clark had spoken to me and contacted the Audit Committee stating that the earliest this could be addressed is our meeting today. 
Department of Finance uh, dates have also slipped, so we are still on time. Members, are you content to respond to the Audit Committee with the same views as we held as a committee on the 20th of February of this year? Members content? Content. Yeah. Content to note. Thank you. Uh, item 6 on the agenda is the Annual Theft and Fraud Report 2018-19. And at this stage, I would like to invite Mr. Stuart Stevenson, Treasury Officer of Accounts, and Ms. Roisin Kelly, Government Accounts Branch of Department of Finance, to the table. Members, can I refer to the letter from the Treasury Officer of Accounts, Mr. Stuart Stevenson, dated the 16th of June 2020, at pages 35 to 48 of your pack, notifying the Committee of the Annual Theft and Fraud Report 2018 um, 2019 report. Uh, can I, at this stage, welcome Mr. Stevenson and Ms. Kelly uh, to the table, um, and uh, would ask you to make a submission before we take questions, if you're happy enough. Thank you, Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I, um, I think we've met before. I'm Stuart Stevenson, Treasury Officer of Accounts, and uh, I'm pleased my colleague, Roisin Kelly, is with me today. Uh, Roisin's Roisin heads up the uh, Government Accounts Branch in Accountability and Financial Management Division, and with that would have uh, some activity around the, the field of, of fraud. Um, do you want to mention some of that? Yeah, so as Chris Stewart said, I'm Head of Government Accounts Branch, and that um, we are responsible for um, the reporting of fraud um, across the, um, uh, the public sector. Um, I'm a member of the Department of Finance Fraud Working Group and also responsible for the organisation of the Fraud Forum, which brings together fraud, pra fraud practitioners from across the departments um, to share best practice and guidance and issues that we're finding. Um, and also then I would oversee um, the reporting of fraud throughout the year that comes in from departments and um, make decisions on whether that needs escalated to colleagues across departments or what action needs taken. Just please, sir, can I just get clarity? Is this beyond government departments? Does it stretch into arm's length bodies and so on as well? Yes, Chair. Um, the, re the report we have today uh, covers the activity of <coughs> departments, agencies, and their ALBs. Uh, the only areas it excludes, I think, are uh, the activity uh, in around the assembly, uh, our friends in the audit office. Uh, and local government as well would sit outside the scope, but the, the statistics in the report would therefore gather uh, all the other uh, information that we're aware of uh, in terms of the fraud. So how does the fraud working group and the fraud forum, which I understand must be two separate bodies, how, do, how are they populated? So the, fraud, um, uh, the fraud working group, so the DOF, um, fraud working group will be made up of representatives from across the Department of Finance, so from land property services, um, CPD and all the business areas within Department of Finance looking at you know fraud, good practice issues, ensuring the guidance there. And then you've got the NICS Fraud uh, Forum, which brings together the representatives from across the different departments. Um, and again, you know it's an information sharing um, group there, and um, so <coughs> best practice just sharing the knowledge um, across to ensure we're all dealing with things consistently and can learn lessons from each other. And does the audit office have a place or even a, 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 um, a role in, as an a, a advisor? Or? The audit office um, is represented on the fraud forum, the NICS fraud forum. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, have you a presentation uh, that you want to make or are you happy to take questions? I'll just make a, a few opening comments, Chair, okay. if that's okay. Mm. Um, really, I suppose that the, the main purpose of this report is, is to highlight uh, across the, the, the public sector the common types of theft and fraud cases uh, that are being perpetrated and to identify measures that will, that will help the public sector bodies prevent and detect fraud and theft in the future. Uh, I think it's important to stress that the, the, the data in here and the cases referred to, it doesn't just include actual uh, cases of fraud but also suspected and attempted <coughs> or prevented cases uh, as well. Um, now, the, there are key areas that uh, have been targeted, and we, we, they have a section uh, of their own that, that highlights um, these are significant areas where there are large volume of cases and um, large value of cases. 
uh, you know, for example, the benefit fraud uh, falling under Department of Communities, um, they were looking at a total loss of around 56 million uh, for the reporting period of 1819. Um, we've, you know, housing benefit fraud over payments of around 1.6 million uh, for the year uh, in land and property services, and we have got, you know, huge amounts of cases. Um, you know, for example, the environmental, or sorry, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, we're looking at over a thousand incidents of uh, reported uh, waste crime, several hundred cases of alleged legal aid fraud, <coughs> tenancy fraud in the housing executive, and so on. So, those large areas, significant areas, are reported and focused on in their own right. Uh, some of the summary information in the, in the first half of the report is about setting those to one side to get meaningful trend analysis for all the other departments and bodies you know to see where the the movement is where the activity is occurring and um and and, and that's the way we, we approach this report uh, i suppose and, and that's where our, our the, the, the key statistics are and, and i think we have a good story to tell certainly at the end of uh, 2019 you know in year-on-year -year comparisons we're looking at a reduction of uh, the, the the number of frauds falling by seven percent on the previous year, and the the total value of the of that reported fraud in eighteen nineteen falling by thirty five percent. So encouraging signs there. In fact, the, the the bank of information we're now building up year on year. We're looking at five year lows in both the number of cases and the value of those cases. So that's certainly. Um, signs of encouragement uh, at the end of the 1819 year. Uh, I suppose in terms of the, the areas that we're, we're looking at and the, the, the lessons we're drawing from this analysis, um, theft remains the, the type of fraud that occurs most often, um, whilst abuse of position uh, remains the type of fraud with the highest total value. Uh, and while, while theft had declined on the previous year, it does remain the, the, the highest frequency of frauds, um, whereas we're seeing growth uh, and the biggest increase in pay-related fraud. So even from a kind of analysis, you can see how that can uh, help inform opinions and provide advice and pathways for departments to react to. Uh, I think, Chair, at that stage, I'm happy to open up for the discussion. Um, okay. You said that the number of cases is down by 7% and, and the value down by 35%. In real terms, in monetary <coughs> terms, um, Mr. Stevenson, how much is that uh, in, to the Northern Public Purse? Yes, the. Um, sorry, Chair, I just have to. That's a good test for my, my miles now. Um, in terms of value, the, um, there's 787,000 pounds worth of frauds. Um, in 1718 and 509,000 pounds in 1819, so it's, there's a decrease of um, about 280,000. Um, you know, in terms of, and that's not all. A lot of that can be estimated. Um, so not all of that was a loss to the public purse either. There, you know, there's values put on um, fraud that has been attempted but prevented, but there's a value on that, but it'll be, which will be included in that 509,000. So it's not. There's been five hundred and nine thousand pounds lost to the public purse. That's the estimated total um, of the different categories in terms of suspected, actual, and attempted but prevented. Right. So the the five hundred thousand figure may not be the loss figure. Yes. That's correct. But we but can provide that analysis that. for you, Chair. I think that would be uh, useful. I think that would be useful. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, I think you, across the cross. Uh, the government departments, if, if we're looking at that figure, that's that's um, a re reasonably. Any fraud is, is wrong and, and whatever, but uh, you know, as a reasonably healthy figure, I can use that term. But in terms of the the, um, do you think because of the the fact that there are these uh, investigations that are going on that this is providing a significant deterrent for people who would perhaps want to engage in fraudulent <coughs> activity? I think uh, the report is is helpful. Um, we, we see this as a key tool in terms of raising awareness, and the report uh, members will have noticed is, is very different to the previous report we, we had produced, mm -hmm. um, which was some of the feedback we've been getting uh, was that it was a little bit dry and repetitive, 
Um, so we, we've made an attempt to kind of change the look and feel of this report in, in the hope that we'll get uh, more wider engagement um, from departments and, and officials. Um, so certainly the, the, the report that you see today is, um, is an attempt at raising that awareness and certainly speaking to our colleagues in Cabinet Office and uh, Scotland and Wales, they would see raising awareness as, as, a, mm. as a key component deterrent but it's it's certainly it's it's one of the factors sure. and um i think the, the the work of our fraud forum is also very important we think and in, in terms of sharing knowledge and experience um, and and in your experience Ms. Kelly, do you get good cooperation across departments around these issues we do i think the um in terms of in department of finance we have you know the, the different representatives and especially like in land and property services and those big areas where there, you know there's the housing benefit fraud and that they and we find that you know people are willing and keen to come along and share you know the actions and activities that they have been undertaking to you know prevent fraud you know um you know what um um say seminars they've been holding for their staff you know one area in land and property services held for housing benefits staff then another you know the land registry staff thought that'll be something good that we can do yes. and equally when we go across to the north the fraud forum which is departmental wide and um, again people are keen to come along and share um, sh you know share their knowledge the experience that they're having <coughs> information that they've been collecting and um, with each other so yes I would say that it's very positive and a very like collective and collab collaborative group you know that are working together yeah, it's good that they're not just prepared to attend, but actually willing to no, help yeah, and cooperate. Yeah. That's that's hugely important. And in terms of your work, um, have you been able to to provide some um, training or uh, case studies that would allow departments uh, to address these issues based on knowledge you have, or um, you know? Previous experience that uh, the, you or colleagues may have been through in the past. I suppose that was part of this report too. Um, it's in terms of this information gathering exercise. It's sharing the lessons that have been learned, and we do have a, um, a, a section in the report um, that deals with that. So it's you know these are like we've tried to like pick out lessons that have been learned across mm. different departments and like common themes that have been there. So. It's like sharing that information, sharing the information in terms of the fraud prevention activities that different departments have undertaken. Um, you know, and then we also um, we work with um, um, Danske Bank, who are our banking partner, um, and we organised for them to come along um, to one of the fraud forums, and they delivered a, a seminar on cyber security and you know the different types of fraud that they were picking up from their end in terms of um, the banking side of things. So we had the members from the fraud forum attend that and. Um, obviously, they've all come from different areas with different questions, but again, it was another very um, well, uh, well engaged and a well attended event. That um, so it's it's trying to organise like organise events like that, training. If you know, I suppose not training as such, but more information sharing and how can we? Yeah, um, best practice. Yeah. 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 Okay, Mr. Beggs. Yes, again, thanks for your presentation. It's important that uh, the public is aware of. Um, action has been taken to detect and, and prevent fraud. Um, you've indicated that there are 95 actual frauds, 97 suspected and 27 attempted in this 18-19 uh, period. Can you just um, go over the definition you have for an actual fraud? Is that proven to a, a, a criminal level uh, that would stand up in court? And what's the definition of suspected? What, what, what level of proof it allows you to class it as a suspected fraud? Is that still in progress, not proven? Or we're just trying to understand the two different categories. Yes, um, we gather information on each individual fraud. We would ask the, the business area in particular to complete a pro forma with the evidence that, that backs that up. Um, and we'd ask them to make their initial assessment in terms of which category they, they feel it falls into. Uh, and certainly we're looking there in terms of actual frauds where there has been a, a financial loss um, suspected there more in a, in a very a, a difficult area to ascertain maybe the value or the, the, if there had been any previous success. We know from looking at profiles that um, most fraudulent activity uh, is carried out on multiple basis as opposed to a one-off fraud. So, you know, sometimes it can, you know, one instance or one control measure 
can be an indication that there may have been difficulties in the past. So um, we, we look at those uh, that information on a case by case basis and try to make a, a, a sensible call in terms of which of these categories we they, they fall into. Um, and then in terms of learning from um, the evidence of, of fraud out there, these figures are 18, 19. The, the more timely this in any report, the better. That's 18 months ago. Uh, obviously, it takes time to gather data. When do we have the next year's uh, well, investigation of yes, fraud the, figures? The, um, 1920, so the information gathering from, for it is usually commissioned around the end of April. This year, obviously, with the pandemic, yeah. that was delayed because we knew departments had other priorities. So we commissioned it in June for returns now at the end of September. And last year, um, there was, I suppose, a timing issue in terms of the, the new format of the report. But following that, and we'll you know, take that report, maybe make a few changes to it this year based on feedback that we've had. But we would anticipate that the 1920 report should be um, available before Christmas. Okay, that's right. And then just finally, uh, Mr Stevenson, you indicated that you provide all the figures for public sector fraud in Northern Ireland except local government and the Northern Ireland Assembly. Where are those figures collated, if there are any? Well, the, the, certainly in terms of the Assembly and the Audit Office, um, that, that would be reported through their own uh, uh, audit risk committees as part of their annual report and accounts for those organisations. And I would suspect uh, it's, it's the same arrangement in terms of the <coughs> government. Um, How does the public get to hear of instances there as well to give them um, confidence that fraud has been investigated wherever it may occur? Yes. Um, again, I suppose the, the annual report and accounts would provide um, a, a lengthy commentary around governance and within that the, the, the respective accounting officer or the, the, the chief executive of the district council will, will sign off um, in terms of uh, any any significant instances that would need to be made public, any disclosures that would that would need to to be made as part of the annual report and accounts process. Okay, thank you, thank you, Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Rhodes. Shall uh, you faster? You're all very welcome here today again. Um, in reading the report, and that in some areas, like I was actually shocked and surprised even at the extent of fraud we say, that exists and in particular in some of the sections in which it actually uh, exists in, in a sense. Uh, but moving around to the stats that were produced there for the uh, Environmental Agency, um, 1,043 incidents of reported waste crime. Uh, only uh, 40 of them, 0.4%, actually instigated a criminal investigation. And of that 0.4% that was investigated, uh, there were only eight convictions. Uh, it's an area, we'll say, at the present time, if anything, that I'd have thought myself as well, too, that where we probably are confronted with the growth uh, in that type of crime. Uh, and it's a very profitable area for those that uh, will uh, be involved in the criminal activity. Uh, for them, um, and I wonder even to what extent that uh, the resources are available, we'll say, to the various departments and so on, to thoroughly uh, confront and deal with that type of crime, uh, and in particular, its cross-border element uh, that would be involved in it as well. Yes, um, I, I absolutely agree with the comments. I think uh, it, it stands out in this report in terms of the, the number of instances. And, and I think as well the fact that it's maintained at a high level. It's been over a 1,000 now for the last few reported years. Um, would indicate that it is a significant problem there. Uh, now the, uh, the, the fraud risk areas that are highlighted separately um, will have a lot more uh, focused approach uh, resources within their own areas. Um, so, for example, the likes of the, the benefit fraud and in terms of communities will have specialist teams that will, will focus on <coughs> it, and their various fraud response plans will um, <coughs> deal with the, the, the specific nuanced areas that, that they fall under. Um, and certainly, you know, we, we, we feel that the um, our role in dealing with the, the, the residual frauds and reporting of those, we're seeing real benefits in that connectivity. Um, so for example, the, the, the Environment Agency 
by being members of our fraud forum can um, get direct feedback from the, uh, the group uh, internal audit and fraud investigation service that exists within the Department of Finance, so they can get some specialist feedback there. Um, I also sit on the Organised Crime Task Force, have a finance subgroup, and on that um, there's representatives from the Department of Justice, there's PSNI, HMRC, the National Crime Agency and the Northern Ireland um, Environment Agency would sit on that. And you know, again, at that forum, um, it's another area where, again, you know, sharing experiences, you know, um, activities that are being undertaken to detect and prevent fraud. Um, so again, it's another cross-departmental forum that's there, and those those agencies, you know, are represented on it. Well, uh, and, and just in addition, I don't know if you're in a position to make a judgment on this or not, but that, uh, do you feel that within that uh, particular agency that they have the resources themselves in order to deal with this uh, increasing type of crime? I know from working on that, from being on that group, that there are there is a, there are resources there that you know, and there it is an area that they're fully engaged with, and you know put in place measures to try and deal with this in terms of the level of resource that's there i i much you know i couldn't comment that they're mm. fully resourced or but i know that there is a team that you know are heavily involved in in looking into the you know in terms of that illegal dumping and um, and that type of fraud okay. i made one comment on that um i think it's it's recent months we have been involved a little bit in the response to covid19 and we've worked with uh, other devolved authorities and cabinet office uh, in that area, and it's it's given us a bit of a contrast in terms of resources. You know, and you can see from cabinet office they have an entire uh, fraud profession, uh, huge resources to, to throw at, at a very difficult problem. And at times like that, you you feel that many of our officials have to pick this up, in addition to a, a very full entry and um, and and uh, that it is what it is. You know, but against that. <coughs> Certainly when we were um, discussing our response to COVID in terms of fraud, we, we could see a little bit about what was happening in Scotland and Wales. And, and I have to say, I was, I was very proud of, of our officials. And certainly we were, um, I think, comparing very well with some of those areas. So maybe on, the, on that side, maybe resource-wise, we are more appropriate. You know, it's, it's very difficult to know. But I think that was, that was an interesting um, comparison for me. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Harvey. Thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, Stuart and Roisin. Um, how has COVID affected your work in the past six months? Um, yes, it's, it's affected our, our day to day activity significantly. Um, certainly, we, we have uh, responsibility for government accounts branch, um, which is the, the daily flow of money. And um, we had established um, uh, a, a very much a, a, an office-based process, so uh, in a very short period of time we had to uh, revolutionise our, our business and, and move to a remote process, and that involved changing our, our procedures and our controls. Um, so certainly that was disruptive for ourselves, and um, and it's affected our ability to maybe focus on some of the, the other priorities that we would normally have spent time on in recent months. Um, However, we did prepare very well for that. I think we kind of we were watching the news. We knew that it was coming, so we did in advance. You know, we had, you know, really, you know, um, you know, strengthened our contingency plan that we had in place and made a lot of changes there. February time, you know, so we were well placed. We had all the IT equipment in place before the 15th of March or the 18th of March. The team were ready. Um, whenever um, we were sent home, to be able to continue to carry out those, you know, business critical um, functions. And do you think there will be any noticeable changes to fraud types now because of the pandemic? As such? Uh, that's that's absolutely what we're we're expecting. Um, and you know, well, it would be very easy to rest on our laurels and say that the, these downward trends were very good at the end of the eighteen nineteen year. Um, I think complacency is the biggest risk uh, in the fight against fraud, and I think COVID has been uh, a very timely reminder of that. Um, and certainly, we were really pleased to engage with the Cabinet Office on their work um, around 
fraudulent activity mm. um, and, and, in response to, to COVID-19. Um, we've worked with them on risk assessments, the, the kind of countermeasures uh, to, to deal with you know, designing and developing um, you know, frictionless countermeasures on the, the stimulus support packages. And we, we've shared the toolkits that have been developed there with our, our business areas in, in the economy and, um, and with the, our fraud investigation service as well. So, um, but, you know, I, I, I saw the article uh, in the Financial Times, I think last weekend, where HMRC were estimating you know, 5 to 10% fraud and error in uh, uh, small business relief schemes, you know, and that's, uh, I think, a 35 billion program. So you would be talking multi billion pounds of theft and fraud. So I think it's, it's a timely reminder that we need to continue putting our best foot forward in this, in this very important area. I know that a lot of those COVID those stimulus packages will be, you know, that threat of fraud is so, so, you know, much stronger because of the the speed with which they have to be implemented. And at, you, at normal circumstances, you would put in these countermeasures in advance to prevent the fraud. But because of the speed that they were all introduced, um, the cabinet office shared with us this um, a post assurance, post event assurance toolkit, which we and I know the group fraud investigation services and Department of Finance. I've shared that across the departments and we have linked in the Department for the Economy and they are using it for a number of the stimulus packages that they were responsible for. So it's looking to go, you know, um, you know, what can they do, you know, how can they, you know, make improvements and, uh, and detect the fraud then that, that's potentially been. So I suppose it is something that we probably do anticipate that there will be, there will, there, 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 inevitably there will be fraud associated with those, those packages. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Boylan. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much for your presentation I'm over in this side. Um, no, I, I welcome it. It's very timely, the report, uh, the presentation today. Um, I am concerned about the, the waste crime issue, mm. and, and you'll find, especially those members who represent border constituencies, that we have seen over the last number of months indiscriminate dumping of residual waste, residual pods, and other materials. Now, it will be capture between council responsibility and the environment agency as well but i mean i'm just wondering in terms of this this these facts and figures the the work in collaboration with local authorities in terms of of the reporting and support because it's key to it as well because that's the generally the first port of call and i've noticed in my own experience over the last number of weeks which is not for this report it will lie again and i would be very very concerned about the figures that my colleagues alluded to, because they seem to be on, on the rise, and the, I certainly COVID has provided an opportunity mm -hmm. for people, unfortunately, to indiscriminately carry out some of these activities. You know, so just in terms of your collaboration with local authorities, in relation to some of the facts and figures. Absolutely, uh, I completely note those comments, and certainly we'll, we'll make sure that that's fed back as as, a, as an issue that the committee have raised to the, the environment agency and. I, I'm also tempted to um, explore how we get maybe closer linkage with uh, district councils. And certainly, I know our department are working a lot closer with uh, councils in terms of city deal work and, and so mm -hmm. on. So um, there's opportunities there uh, to, to try to make better connections and, um, and make sure that they're, they're, that they're collaborating as much as we can. Can I just you know? can I just come in here to reinforce your point, if you don't mind? Um, in my constituency, um, a number of months ago, mm. there was a serious um, uh, amount of illegal dumping going on at an industrial scale, in fact, 200 tonnes. Uh, and uh, a number of people came to my office and I immediately contacted uh, local government, the Environment Agency and the police. Um, I don't think, and I'll be brutally honest, in my, in my um, experience of that issue, in that particular case, that there is a sufficiency in joined upness. The response was slow um, uh, from both the Environment Agency and the Council. Uh, I raised, it ended that uh, I had to raise the issue with the Minister and ask the Minister to intervene directly. Uh, so I think there is a greater need for joined upness. This is now happening at a growing level because of the 
the implications of COVID and the fact that many dumps have been closed. I can only speak for Belfast, but many dumps have been closed in our capital city, and therefore these these companies who are there to alleviate the problem and take away your problem in terms of your rubbish, um, and some of them, I'm not suggesting for a moment that all of them are um, uh, acting illegally, but clearly some of them are, and they're breaking the law, and they are uh, destroying the environment, the polluting areas. The, in, in the case I'm talking about, it led to serious rat infestation, fly infestation, uh, people who, who complained of being ill, uh, and, and, and we had a primary school right beside the site that, 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 that would have been operating had COVID not been there. We had, we had pensioners living in bungalows right beside the site. And to give people, as was given, four to five weeks to clear that, when people are having to live with that sort of infestation in this day and age, far, far too slow. And there needs to be a quicker, more robust response. And in my opinion, uh, Stuart, if you would feed it back, it, there needs to be a greater joint upness. I don't think there's a sufficiency in terms of the joint upness. And one of the other issues is, when I, as a member of this assembly, contacted the Environment Agency for an update on what was happening, they were telling me that they were dealing with the issue, but they couldn't give me any specifics. I presume because they were possibly building, or, or what they do is build a case for potential prosecution, and I understand that. But when you've got when you've got hundreds of people who are being affected by this uh, across uh, an area. That is hugely frustrating for any elected representative not to be able to provide them with information. And I think there's a huge uh, job of work needs to be done in Northern Ireland to get the joint upness across regional government and local government uh, to, to address this issue. And I'm sorry for coming, but, but, it, that's, but it. That's fine, sir. <clears throat> and I just wanted to highlight the point. I mean, it has increased in, in, in my experience in the number of reports as, as local councillors. But there's, there was one other point I just want to go on as page. Five of, of the it's under the actual prevented and suspected fraud. Um, just a couple of columns I want to maybe ask you to tease out some things, please. You see, in relation to the contractor fraud, which is slightly concerning because it's actual 50 and suspected 50, um, and, and then also the payment process related, which is at 48 percent actual. Um, and while some of the figures may not, you know, they may not sound grand in the in the amounts, it's the actual attitude to doing those things, you know. Would you expand a wee bit on that? Because, you know, we're hoping to learn from this and, and make progress. But I, I can see the, the theft of assets issue. I think will will always be slightly higher anyway. But but those two figures in terms of certainly the attitudes toward contract fraud and payment process related, I would be slightly slightly concerned. Could you sort of outline a wee bit more, identify a wee bit more in relation to those two columns, please? I suppose the contractor fraud this year um, was significantly down. You know, in 1718 there was 41,000 pounds worth of contractor fraud. In 1819 there was 500 pounds, um, and it was relating to um, contractors overcharging for um, goods and services. So um, there are controls, obviously, within. You know, finance branches, business areas who are responsible when invoices come in. Um, you know, for checking those, and so I suppose there's been a significant improvement there in terms of the contractor fraud. Like it, it is minimal this year, and there are those controls that are put in place across. No, no, appreciate it. It's just when you look at the column, it's still up at 50 percent. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying the column I'm looking at here. It's just it's, it's 50 percent actual and 50 percent suspected. I appreciate it's down. So and it's progress. You mean it? Yeah, it's just the way the, the columns look. That's a, yeah. actual and ha you know some yeah. still weren't determined to be uh, proven yet. So okay. half of them were suspected. Yeah. Okay. Okay, Chair. No, thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Muir. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. And I would agree with the comments earlier in relation to the whole issue of environmental crime. And declare was previously a member of Argyll North Down for a council, but I've seen the statistics around that in recent months, and I've seen the evidence of that and. Also, unfortunately, the speed of response and joined up response has been a concern. Um, and it's just to see this report from 1819, um, and now we're into September 2020. Um, understanding that whenabouts we're going to get the report from 1920, and also 
there's obviously trends developing here in relation to fraud um, because of the COVID-19 situation. Most of that we're learning about through the media, and it's just whether you'll be able to report to us what do you feel the trends are and uh, up to you know the present moment in time in terms of fraud around COVID-19. And also, you mentioned the issue of resourcing and whether you feel you're sufficiently resourced to be able to deal with that. Both in terms of the 1920 yeah. report, um, as mentioned there, we um, commissioned it in June and the returns are due back in um, September, the end of this month, um, for the 1920 information, and that report should be ready before Christmas right. this year in the same format as last year. Um, in terms of the trends that are developing as a result of COVID-19, because COVID. I, I don't want to have a situation where I only find out about those you know, in the new year, potentially. And I think that's something we could maybe take away, especially with the committee's interest in it. Um, it might be mm. something that we can think about including in the 1920 report, uh, mm. just to, to kind of get a flavour for any emerging trends that have taken place in the first quarter of, of this year. And it would certainly complement the work of the Northern Ireland Audit Office looking at the departmental response I, I to think, COVID. I think also, if I might come in, um, um, Mr. Muir, it might be an idea if, if, if the report's going to be ready for December. As opposed to waiting to next September, we might look at it in the early part of the new year, uh, in terms of because that will give a reflection on the situation, and I, what I believe will be an escalation of the situation because of COVID, and people exploiting that negatively, unfortunately. Yeah. Both the, the 1920 re report will focus up to the 31st of March, oh, right. um, 2020, but we could put in. Um, you know, a separate section within the report mm. in yeah, terms of COVID. Obviously, it will relate to the first quarter of 2021. Okay. But yeah. yeah, that would be useful. And yeah. just, just in relation to resourcing, you did mention some concerns how you've seen how other bodies across the water are resourced and whether that is a concern, whether we're sufficiently resourced in Northern Ireland to tackle this threat of fraud. Uh, I think it's difficult to offer a, a global picture, and certainly some organisations, um, you know, by the very nature of their business, you know, we talked earlier about um, benefit fraud and the huge value there. So they have huge teams of staff that are working day and daily and earning LPS and housing benefit. There specific teams to focus on it, um, and and while this data would maybe uh, summarise the activity in, in in other departments, there would be a lot of lower numbers of staff and dedicated man hours to, to this area. You know, and and I think the challenge is. Um, Prioritising and, and uh, taking a risk-based approach to, to the resources that are available, um, but yes, there are there are times when uh, it would be it would be nice to you know push some additional resources. Uh, <coughs> at this, at, there, there's certainly an appetite out there to do more in this in this field, and we see it at the fraud forum. Um, you know that people are, are very keen to, to to learn lessons from others and. And adapt new policies and procedures uh, off the back of those discussions, you know. And, and there, there's no question at, at times um, with competing priorities out there, it's it's it's, it's difficult. Um, but I do believe departments in the main make the best decisions they can. Each department does have their own counter fraud team, so there are you know there are dedicated teams to looking at fraud in the departments. Um, but again, in terms of how much resource they have and if they've got enough. A question I have to ask them. Okay. Um, it's just following on from some of the points that Mr. Moore made, um, and he actually just addressed one of those at the end because I was going to ask um, around really the activity from one of these reports is um, compiled and you have the data collected, which is obviously done on an annual basis. Um, it's in the process of what takes place in that year until the next report comes along and how you can try and coordinate that with the different departments. Um, obviously, put the measures in place, it's been suggested. Um, so I was wondering, um, you know, is there an official um, or an individual that's assigned to each department where you can see the trends where you're having difficulty with, with the fraud? Um, so it's good to know that each department obviously has the counter-fraud team. So throughout the year then, um, would I don't know if it would be you guys in the fraud forum, um, would it be from that structure? Would you have any sort of direct or ongoing contact throughout the year then with the counter fraud teams in each of the departments? Um, I'm just conscious each year if your reports are, um, you know, um, if there are given measures that need to be put in place to try and help the 
departments bring the level of fraud down? Um, where does the accountability lie? Do you know who, who essentially is overseeing that? Is it the minister? Is it the fraud forum? Or I yeah, I think uh, well, in, in, in terms of accountability, the uh, I, I would say ultimately the accounting officer is responsible for the, an appropriate control. Uh, an environment in, in their own department and have a, a critical role to play um, in, in structuring that. Uh, I suppose from a practical point of view, I could talk a little bit about what, what we would do. We would receive fraud notifications from the various departments and business areas um, on a day-to-day, -day, week week-to-week basis as, the, as they're aware of those frauds. Um, and certainly we will assess those um, to to get a sense of the, the value involved, the severity of the, the, the fraud, uh, any new risks or new patterns emerging. Um, and, and we have a couple of options there, and we would deploy it in different ways. Sometimes we would table it at the next fraud forum uh, to share that knowledge with, with everybody else and to ask other business areas if they have encountered any similar difficulties or challenges. Uh, we also would use our colleagues in supply divisions, um, where there are teams allocated to each department. Um, and they would be in uh, regular contact on the public expenditure exercises and any significant issues. That's, that's, we have found that quite helpful as well, that at least it is being raised with the, the respective finance director in that particular department, that the OF are concerned maybe about something that has emerged. Um, and Usually then we will get some feedback in terms of how the department are dealing with it. And Again, then if, if we feel that is appropriate, that is good. But if not, then we can raise that further if we're, if we're not happy with it. So we find those are quite practical and um, more timely in terms of dealing with the frauds during the year uh, before we before we look at the end of the year. But certainly that's why I think this report is more about looking at the overall trends and uh, and where we're heading. But there's a few steps there. How do you then through the fraud forum, you know, share those? Um, so whilst we meet um, formally. Um, twice a year, we also then would be in regular contact with that group. You know, there's a the group whether it's just by email or telephone call. You know, so like information was disseminated timely as opposed to just waiting for the next meeting. Or um, so there's that there's that um, method of communication as well. There's a process in place, but as the the last <laughs> end question, had additional resources. I'm sure there's always ways and means to improve. And yeah, that is it's. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can I just say, in terms of in terms of um, people who, who people who um, are involved in criminal activity around illegal dumping, um, in terms of the recourse uh, to recover money or assets, you mentioned the police are potentially involved. National Crime Agency are involved. Um, you know how how rigorous and robust is that in terms of pursuing people, because. If people profit from illegally dumping and they damage or destroy the environment, that has to be made good in terms of the taxpayer repairs expense. That then has to be, in terms of collecting it and clearing it away, it then has to be disposed of legally. And then the area has to be made good, all of that, at the, at the public purse expense. I mean, are we robust enough to 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 have recourse to, to to find people, or prosecute people, or take assets? There are the, there are those processes in place, and there are, you know, um, in terms of the environment agency, they will have. Yeah, I accept they're in place, Rasheem, but I'm asking, are we robust enough? Because those figures, to me, less than four percent suggest we're not. Uh, yes, I uh, absolutely agree there with those comments. I think um, we know from the empirical evidence uh, to to get on top of fraud, you need to make it as difficult as yes. possible for the fraudster to take place. And mm. a big part of that is that the that the more severe penalties will will act and discourage and, them. And and in the issue of resource, Sir Teams, and and you don't need me to tell you this. That resource may well soon pay for itself if people were actually, uh, actually having to pay larger fines, uh, have their assets seized, or have to pay to make good that that they've destroyed, uh, and, and, and communities that have to live beside it as well. And all the anxiety 
that they, they will have caused. But if you just bear that in mind, Mr. O'Toole. Thank you. Um, just uh, um, thanks for your evidence. Just on the um, on benefit fraud, it's fifty six. So nineteen twenty was fifty six million pounds, basically a benefit fraud, and that's about just under one percent of the DFC budget. I'm being lazy and possibly uh, asking, but like, roughly speaking, how does that compare with DWP? The equi what would be the equivalent figure for DWP? Do we know the percentage terms? I can answer those questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's uh, slightly higher in DWP. Right. Uh, I qualify my opinion Chair, on the uh, Department of Communities accounts on Social Security fraud every year. Mm -hmm. So it's running at the minute that uh, it's fraud and error combined. Mm -hmm. We can't disentangle them. It's, uh, it's less than 2% here at the minute. So it's a bit higher in GB. Uh, and uh, it was running higher a few few years ago. Two percent in GB or uh, in GB, yes. So there was a higher rate in, in, in GB. Um, jury's still out in some of this because we a lot of welfare reform working through the system uh, with, with new regime coming in. So there's uh, the the accounts have been qualified for uh, both here and in GB for many years because of the level of uh, fraud and error. On the face of it, we're more honest. Or we're less good at detecting. But, um, uh, I won't. Okay. Um, and just on the question of um, what you rightly said is, of, there's obviously inherently going to be a, a significant increase in um, the uh, COVID recovery and COVID. You know, all the various COVID-19 measures. You you can't do those interventions without having inherently an increased risk of fraud and error. Um, I think you may have covered it before, but is there a specific work stream to sort of stop take on all that and learn lessons, understanding that a volume of intervention will, will inherently mean, as we said, more fraud and error? But it, it would just seem, and have you talked about resource, it would seem that just doing it in a kind of normal annual process would be quite a big undertaking and you might lose some of the discrete lessons. Just as part of the cabinet of the working group that we have been part of, um, in the past um, few months since April, um, and that, that group was set up specifically to look at COVID. Which group? It was, it was a devolved authority working group that was set up by the Cabinet Office, right. um, and it was to look at specific um, issues around fraud um, in relation to the COVID. You mentioned this earlier, yeah. So it was looking at the stimulus packages, fraud around procurement, um, and we, um, while there was representatives from Scotland and Wales on that group and Cabinet Office, and we had um, quite a significant num mem number of members from Northern Ireland. So we had representatives from DFE, um, from the PSNI, from HMRC, um, to, um, looking at the, and Invest NI, looking at the different um, um, areas that were, you know, at risk and what procedures we could put in place, what we were doing here, what, you know, comparable to what was happening in Scotland and Wales. So that group was set up. Um, and I know that in DFE and, and themselves, you know, they are looking, you know, um, using like the different toolkits that have been provided to look at, you know, fraud in, in relation to those stimulus packages specifically. And are there any, if you're sort of looking at it in real time then, are there any specific areas where you know there have been issues and have you made adjustments? But I think or not you so specifically, far, but the, the... Yeah, it's the, still so early that what we do know and we have had a number of frauds in relation to the small uh, business, the grant scheme, um, but obviously you know that was deployed before before any measures effectively could be put in place. So then there's there's this like looking back, you know, on what what areas were more exposed, and in terms of investigations they can do after the event, DFE are carrying um, are looking at that. If I could just uh, add to that, I think the um, purchase of PPE was an area that was discussed at length and. Well, it's not our area of expertise. I know our colleagues in, in procurement directorate um, were were following on closely from some of the guidance out there. Um, you know, discounting suppliers that were looking for um, significant sums of money up front uh, and and so on. So certainly the, the 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 sharing of lessons there, I think, added a lot of value to the work of CPD and and that hub in terms of targeting and conducting due diligence on on that supplier network. Uh, so the clear benefits there. Uh, and we'd look forward to seeing how that pans out uh, in, the, in the months ahead. Um, 
not really in the practice of doing this, but very quickly, Mr. Boylan and Mr. McHugh, will come in in that order. Okay, Chair, yes, just in something you'd said about okay. the joint upness. Rushing, you did say there's different units in different departments, which is grand, and, and you do meet once or twice a year, but and there's also mention of accounting officer there from yourself. Um, the issue for, for myself and, and probably some of my colleagues is, is how we roll that out, because we, we still feel departments are operating in silos. And I know you're working well in terms of gathering reports, but it's about investigation, it's about how you follow up on it, which my colleague already answer, asked about. But it's about being proactive as well, and it's about being robust and joined upness. So I would like to see some more of that come back together, working mm. collectively. Because there's some good work, you'll respond to this and you've learned from this, but how all that rolls out. And I think we miss, we miss an opportunity there. I know everybody's busy doing their own thing, but at some point we need it collectively to yeah, share all the resources. I don't think any, any a committee in this assembly would refuse people more resources if they were requesting them to do their job. So, I don't, you know what I mean? so I'd like to see more of that. And, and maybe in some of your reports or yeah. follow up reports. No? Mr. McHugh. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I should have asked this, uh, uh, the first uh, round of questions. It's in relation to the Housing Executive. Uh, again, I was sort of surprised and disappointed just that the number of cases were investigated in terms of tenancy fraud. Now, uh, the issue that I'm actually getting at here is that um, uh, I think that the Housing Executive should hear uh, that to hide behind. Uh, well, we will investigate the NA properties that are sort of reported to us to hide behind that, that we're there depending nearly entirely on a whistleblower in the community to tell them where this uh, gold drop is. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that when I look at a figure like 285, and I think of that for the whole of the north of Ireland, um, if anything, it's a gross underestimate. Uh, I think that there's a whole lot more gold drops uh, that. Uh, in fact, deprive the needy of uh, the availability uh, of housing. And I have seen that, we'll say, in the Dairy City and Stavane District Council area, and I'm sure it applies in every other council area as well. But whenever this question has been addressed to the housing executive, their pat response is, well, if someone tells us where it's at, we'll go along and investigate it. I think they should be more proactive. I think they should be much more proactive themselves rather than depending on and let's use the word that, um, that, that, that doesn't sound so nice, a squealer in the community, because that's how they're actually seen then. And people end up carrying that kind of guilt that in the event of them reporting a, a dole drop, that they themselves are exposed one or the other. Uh, I do think that housing sector should be more proactive in that whole area. And I think that there's a whole lot more than 285 cases in the north of Ireland. And then whenever you look at uh, the amount of properties that were recovered, 41 the whole of the six counties, I just think a complete underestimate of what in fact is going on there. Okay, um, I suspect that um, that uh, that's right. Um, um, you've clearly seen that the committee is very interested in, in this, uh, and if you could liaise with Mr. Steams, if you could liaise with the clerk and the team about coming back in there early in the new year, then we we look, we look at these figures. Um, I think that um, the, the view that we would take is that early intervention around so much of these these cases, um, there is no guilt, in my view, Mr. McHugh, in someone passing on uh, information to the police or the housing executive or whatever of criminality taking place and people being denied uh, the right to have good uh, uh, quality housing. Um, and I think the more the public does that, the better. But the difficulty and the frustration for the public, if that is done, if the resource isn't there to follow it through, then people then are discouraged from doing that sort of thing. And 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 so therefore, what I would say is this: um, you know, resourcing. Uh, we can always do with more resource, and we know we're in stringent times. Um, it struck me. I think you said, um, Ms. Kelly, that the um, the fraud um, forum meets twice a year. How often does the fraud um, group meet? The Department of Finance mm. fraud, so they would meet on a quarterly basis. Right. I'm not so sure that twice a year, given the amount of fraudulent activity going on here, um, and it feeds into the point that Mr Boyle made earlier, in terms of pursuance of people, joined upness, 
and ensuring that there is that connectivity across government, whether regional and local government. Um, I, I think uh, twice a year, you know, could could be looked at. Just to add as well there in terms of the joined up working we are um, looking at um, uh, the implementation of the Digital Economy Act, which will enable um, departments and specifically in that a fraud um, section, which will allow um, government departments and public sector bodies to share information across um, across government to be able to in terms of the detection of fraud to try okay. and capture information at an earlier okay. stage. Well, look, thank you both very much indeed um, for your attendance and your, your um, presentation and your uh, answering of questions. As I say, we are very interested in this issue and we look forward to you coming back in the new year. Excellent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, members, thank you very much. Um, we'll move on then to... Um, Agenda, sorry, agenda item number seven, which is the inquiry into major capital projects, pages 48 to 71 in your main pack. At this point, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Kieran Donnelly, uh, Controller and Auditor General, Mr. Kyle Bingham, Assembly uh, Support Officer, to the table. The audit team will stay at the table for the remainder of the meeting. Um, following on from our meeting on the 8th of July, uh, when we received evidence sessions from the departments, we have now received information requested by the committee. If you could just hang on a second, just to do some cleaning there. Um, um, I refer to the correspondence of pages 50 and 54, dated the 24th of August, from Tracy Maharg, the uh, accounting officer and permanent secretary of the Department of Communities. Ms. Maharg has forwarded a breakdown of the £10 million for Casement Park overspend. Uh, how this occurred, information on the capital oversight programme, the details of the department's capital underspend. Uh, there is also instruction on how the access of the Northern Ireland planning portal that the member access the most of the up-to-date plans for Casement Park. Um, so, essentially, um, members then, we um, refer to page 55, dated the 27th of August. Sue Gray, the um, uh, Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance, providing the committee with a response to the current procurement membership, and refer to members of pages 56 to 71, dated the 27th of August, from Katrina Godfrey, Permanent Secretary of the Department of Infrastructure. Ms. Godfrey has included a list of 40 outstanding planning projects. This stage uh, at each uh, at each is at, and how long it has been on the list and the reasons why. She has also given information on the different uh, procurement centres of expertise in the department. Um, now, members, I know that some members will have questions around these things, um, so I don't propose to note any of them, uh, because I think um, we, we shouldn't ask permanent secretaries to um, provide us with information and then simply note it. Um, that's not good scrutiny. So um, members will have questions. So before we take those questions, um, can I seek your approval that we now moved into closed session to discuss the ongoing inquiry into capital projects and we will then stay in closed session for the remainder of the meeting. Members content? Agreed. Agreed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly.